Uh, welcome everybody to this HYS Now on Convergence and Water Research. Um, as you know, the HYS is a research collaborative network and the HYS Now um, is a series of panels that discusses important topics for advancing research in our community. Um, the Household Water Insecurity Experiences Network is dedicated to nurturing collaborative, supportive, interdisciplinary research on water. And today we're focusing on convergence, which is a new approach to interdisciplinary scholarship um, that has been met with some controversy and much research funding. So the colleagues we have here today um, have been funded under three different convergence grants in the last few years, and we are going to discuss their experiences. Um, so if each of you could introduce yourselves, tell us your name, your university um, title, discipline, and the name or focus of your convergence grants, starting with Dr. Krista Harper. Hi, I'm Krista Harper. I am a professor at UMass Amherst, uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, in anthropology and public policy. And um, the project that I have been, um, the Convergence Research Grant that I have been on has been a, um, a project called ELEVATE, which stands for Elevating Equity Values in the Transition of Energy Systems. And so its focus is on um, the, the transition to renewable energy, and in particular, uh, how that will uh, play out and uh, what we can do about the social uh, equity dimensions of that uh, technological, socio-technical transition. Thank you, Krista. Now, um, Dr. Anais Roque, who's joining us from Puerto Rico and has an unstable interconnect connection, but we have the pleasure of seeing and hearing her right now. So let's grab this chance to get her intro. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Um, so my name is Anais Roque. I am an assistant professor of anthropology at The Ohio State University. I work closely with Amber Woodich on the um, GCR, um, Growing Convergence Research um, Action for Water equity. Um, it's a big team of social scientists, engineers, data scientists, social hydrologists, and three community partners, and 72 colonias across the U.S.-Mexico border, looking at um, social and physical infrastructures for water security. Thank you, Anais. And Laura Castro-Diaz, Dr. Laura Castro-Diaz. Hi, everyone. Buenos dias. I am Laura Castro-Diaz. I am now a postdoc a researcher at Arizona State University. I am a sustainability scholar. I got my PhD at Michigan State where I was part of the Convergence a project a, that was entitled Empowering of Grid Communities with Sustainable Energy Technologies. And it was mainly focused on the Amazon, of the Brazilian Amazon and in some regions of Detroit. Uh, and I'm super excited about the conversation that we're gonna have today. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for coming. So as you can see, um, Anais and I are part of water convergence projects and Krista and Laura are part of energy projects, but we all share the sort of socio-ecological approach. Um, and I think today our focus is really going to be thinking about how social science can integrate into these convergence projects. Um, and so I think we are all equally able to weigh in on this difficult and interesting topic. Um, so the first question I'm gonna ask is by far the hardest and the most controversial, which is, um, can you please tell us what you think convergence is? And for bonus points, how might convergence be different from other interdisciplinary approaches? Um, and I think I will start with Anais because we've just been writing a paper that obligated us to debate this endlessly for the last three months. So it'll be interesting to see where Anais is in her thinking. <laughs> Thanks, Amber. So I think for, for us, for, for our team in particular, for me, when I think about convergence, it's going beyond. So we know that there's this dimension. You have disciplinary work, you have interdisciplinary work, you have transdisciplinary work, and then you have convergence. Then convergence 
is meant to go a little bit over what you do with transdisciplinary teams to develop new fields, new areas of studies, new methodologies that really like go beyond bridging, but really synthesizing, in, in our case, um, social ecological and um, engineering sciences in, in our approach for the quest of um, water security, water equity. So it's definitely, there's a lot of the literature has been really in the SDS, um, science and technology studies, um, bi biomedical studies. Some, a lot of disaster scholars have advanced convergence quite in a way is different than um, these other two disciplines. And now we're seeing it more integration in, in social sciences, thinking about how our disciplinary um, focuses can bring new, new approaches and new ways of thinking for problems in the 21st century. And AC, I think you were, you briefly mentioned Dr. Lori Peake's research at the University of yes. Colorado Boulder, which is this foundational um, convergence research and disaster. Can you give us a thumbnail about what Dr. Peake's group is doing? Yes, so their group looks at convergence um, through the integration of emergency managers and disaster scholars, which is a broadly interdisciplinary field. And they have been really doing convergence research for a lot of years, but they didn't necessarily call it convergence at that time. I think language is also a new thing that you can see across disciplinary focuses that in some ways are doing the ideas of convergence as we see it through the NSF definitions, but um, Lori Peake's group, Dr. Peake's group, and is trying to look at that from at the hazard component. And they have in the Natural Hazard Center a whole set of modules that help um, social scientists, data scientists, engineers engage in convergences modules that that help train the next generation of um, disaster scholars are thinking across disciplinary focuses and more integrated. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Krista Harper, can you please tell us what you think convergence is? Sure. Um, we we actually spent a lot of time uh, looking at all of the different articles on what is convergence research, and um, and you know, in terms of the um, and and what I've landed on is that I like actually the latest may not be the latest article because you guys are writing at a fast clip, but my favorite was. Um, uh, Anais's uh, article on um, participatory convergence, which is the approach that really matched what we were aiming for in our project uh, the best and also gave us good ideas about how to do it better. Um, but the way that I see convergence is, um, you know, many of the papers are like, it's like interdisciplinary research, only more deeply integrated. <laughs> and, and you're like, okay, but how? Where is the mark of more deeply integrated? Um, and I think that one of the means of doing that is um, having a problem focused research. So, research that's focused on a, a specific area that has so many different dimensions, like disaster or water management or the renewable energy transition, where no one discipline can really take the lead on it, and where enough research has been done on topics related to that uh, to that problem that everybody knows they aren't going to be able to go it alone and be the superstar discipline. Um, and I think that that really makes a difference um, where there's a level of awareness that we really need to pay attention to, you know, how the different facets come together. And because of that, I would say, um, as an anthropologist thinking about, you know, watching my own team, um, and we've got a team at Elevate that includes electrical engineers, industrial operations engineers, um, mechanical engineers, anthropologists, e economists, um, uh, environmental scientists, computer scientists. So we have a really wide ranging group of people coming together in this, um, uh, geographers coming together in this project. And uh, one of the things that I see as sort of a as a hallmark of convergence is that it's similar to what we went through in anthropology, you know, sort of a generation ago in terms of self-reflexivity, that in order to work together as a team, you have to make your uh, disciplinary assumptions and training and inclinations legible to other people. 
um, so that they can understand why you're approaching a problem from that angle um, and figure out how to collaborate with you. And so, um, and so I, I, I tend to think of um, convergence research, one of the, it, it may not be the definition of it, but it definitely is a form of, uh, you know, interdisciplinary research that's deeply collaborative and that requires uh, a higher level of self-reflexivity about your sort of epistemological uh, assumptions and uh, underpinnings and, and how your discipline approaches problems. Thank you, Krista. That way you did an amazing job defining it. And I really like that you brought out this element of self-reflexivity. People in my research group who are here know that Dr. Melissa Hafner at Portland State University published recently a paper that got her convergence team to do autoethnography. And it is quite a feat of scholarship. And so I think it, you know, that paper is a perfect example of really where this self-reflexivity is meant to come in through the convergence process. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Laura Castro Diaz, can you tell us what you think convergence is? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I do agree with all of the things that you have mentioned. I think that we are in the same page. So that seems that we are fine. We are in the good track. I will add, like, besides fostering and integrating different disciplines uh, and having this problem driving approach, uh, in the team that I was working, we included an um, community engagement aspect. So for us, convergence is also allowing us to um, implement bottom-up approaches and not the common top-down things where researchers or decision makings get together and decide what they think that is good for the communities. And then they go and implement that in the field. And in the end, we don't have like a good uh, result. So in our project in particular, we are working from the beginning with community members in the areas where we um, we are working on in the Brazilian Amazon, but we are also including and fostering the communication between researchers in the global north and in the global south. We want to highlight that people in the global south are also doing high quality research and convergence has allowed us to integrate the knowledge from engineers here in the US with engineers there in Brazil and in other areas social scientists, natural scientists, and other um, like different stakeholders. So that's what for me, like convergence goes beyond any interdisciplinary approach. It brings this community engagement aspect, but also the collaboration between Global North and Global South uh, researchers. Perfect. So to recap, um, at least for environmentally focused convergence projects, we think that convergence is about a sort of radical interdisciplinarity that goes deeper than other approaches, that focuses on a practical problem in which no single discipline can take the lead in solving it, and involves some kind of participatory element such that the researchers are not imposing a solution on the communities, but working with communities to generate that solution. Great. Um, we are going to come back in a couple of minutes to this issue of how to do participatory methods in the context of a convergence project, because our experience, at least, was that it was quite challenging. Um, I want to pause for a second and share some other insights that I think might add to this experience of convergence, because when we got when we began to be funded, we'd never heard of this before, even though it's been in the literature for quite some time. And, you know, we consider ourselves very cutting edge transdisciplinary scholars, but the convergence thing was new to us. So it came across my desk because at my university um, at that time, one of my colleagues, Dr. John Sabo, who's now the director of the Bywater Institute at Tulane University, was charged with sort of like convening researchers to apply for large grants. And so he's like, okay, we're gonna get a team together and this is what the team is gonna look like and we're gonna do a convergence. We're like, this team has difficulties. Like, we don't know how to talk to each other. He's like, perfect. Like, is that, are you sure? He's like, yeah, this is, this is what they want to see. A bunch of teams who can't talk to each other. I'm like, I don't, so one of our, <laughs> one of our colleagues who is a, is a genius is Dr. Wen Wen Li, who is a geographer who works on water issues, but is a data scientist. And I'm like, John, John, I can't even understand what Wen Wen does. And he's like, yes, yes, I believe you. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Once we got funded, we went to the first sort of convening um, group at the National Science Foundation. The project, the program manager was like, so listen, you guys are funded. 
a lot of people don't really understand what they're getting into. This is probably not going to be for some of you, right? She's like, it's very intensive. You know, you can't just kind of like do your work and then bring it together at the end. You have to intensively be integrating at all times and, you know, proving that you converge. We're like, what does that even mean? How do you prove that you converge? And she's like, you have to create a new integrated field of scholarship. We're like, well, how do we prove that we did that? She's like, oh, you know, you could have like a conference or like a special issue of a journal, but you have to convince us. So we're like, um, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, this idea of how do you show that you converge and what does it mean to have converge became very central to our struggles as a team. So um, I would encourage everyone to reflect on that as you, we have a series of questions. So we're gonna ask each of you to please walk us through um, the study in which you took a convergence approach. And in particular, we'd like to know what environmental problem did you wanna solve? Um, and did water play a role, if at all? Uh, what was your funding mechanism and how did it work? Because there are different convergence funding mechanisms. Um, what was the setting and how did you choose this research site? What scholarly fields did you focus on converging and why? Um, and can you walk us through how your project developed and what you accomplished? And if there are any key findings that you wanna share, like toot your horn. Um, so who would like to go first? Okay, since that I was a resound, oh, okay, <laughs> thank you, Krista. I'll volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Got this. All right, so uh, as I mentioned before, uh, our group is Elevate. It's um, elevating equity values in the transition of energy systems. And um, uh, our, our uh, growing, we got uh, funding through the NSF Growing Convergence Research Mechanism, but we also got at the very same moment a, um, an NRT, which is uh, uh, support for research and training, and it gives a lot of funding for graduate students. And our goal was to really change who was doing the research um, as well as what kinds of research that we were doing. So uh, very aggressively or, or uh, alluringly <laughs> recruiting um, uh, graduate students who are from the communities that are the most affected by um, by environmental justice issues and um, and uh, the renewable energy transition. So we were simultaneously doing a GCR project and a grad student uh, training and mentoring project, which made it a lot more fun to do the convergence uh, kind of activities because uh, we were integrating faculty and grad students in a very, um, with a lot of grad students. Um, in terms of what environmental problem we're uh, looking at the transition of renewable energy systems and going from it, basically going through all of the scales from uh, households and consumer level uh, energy systems and residential electrification and uh, energy efficiency and questions like that, all the way up to uh, more systemic levels like transmission and um, building out the grid and um, building out storage as well as generation. And we have uh, engineers and uh, folks from other disciplines who are working on questions related to those uh, different scales all through those scales. And because that covers a lot of ground, it does intersect with water issues, even though we would never claim to be a water management uh, project because that is such a distinctive area of expertise. Um, but of course, a lot of the, uh, some of the renewable energy systems are hydropower. And so we have geographers and environmental um, scientists who work, uh, you know, basically in hydrology and sedimentology and the politics of uh, hydroelectric dams and uh, transmission. Um, so that's one way that it intersects with uh, water. And of course, a lot of the um, sort of low hanging fruit of uh, energy storage is in uh, reservoirs and, um, and pumped, uh, pumped uh, water storage systems. And those also come with, uh, you know, social and political controversies um, and ecological effects. So that's a way that water intersects, even though it's not, we're not centering water, but water is always there. 
Um, and of course, anytime you're dealing with fossil fuels um, and either getting rid of them or uh, keeping them, uh, that affects water quality as well. Um, our setting is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're working on a lot of different scales, but we have anchored our uh, sort of uh, community-based research in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and the Springfield, which is in the Springfield metropolitan area. So we have a small project going on in Springfield, but it's mostly in Holyoke, um, which is a, um, it was one of the early industrial uh, revolution cities in um, in the U.S. And uh, at that time, it was all based on hydropower. Um, and it has since uh, gone away from renewable energies and now is coming back to renewable energies and has made a lot of investments, um, but also has a lot of the um, socioeconomic disparities of many uh, deindustrializing cities in the northeastern United States. Um, and so uh, we have collaborated with um, some local climate justice organizations that have been active in uh, trying to advocate for a just uh, renewable, tra uh, renewable energy transition and linking that to uh, issues that uh, low and moderate income households and um, immigrant households and um, migrant households uh, find more uh, relatable to their immediate struggles, such as housing, heating, energy debt, um, utilities debt. And so, um, so our convergence approach, we've really been inspired, as I mentioned before, by this concept of participatory uh, convergence. And, um, and so we're trying to deeply integrate um, uh, community collaboration. And um, uh, in terms of how we have brought together a team that spans so many disciplines, um, one of the, we, we had a little extra time actually to work on convergence because um, many of our plans for community-based research were slowed down by the pandemic. We got funded in, uh, 20, in 2020. And so that gave us sort of a, a year of slow walking um, where we were building relationships, building strong relationships with the leadership of community organizations, but the level of activity um, and events uh, made it difficult to really have a lot of um, the kind of naturalistic community-based research that anthropologists try to create in their field sites. Um, but it gave us time to uh, really develop a strong uh, sort of common under set of understandings with our community partner, um, at least the leaders of those organizations, and also to work together as um, researchers. And one of the things that I've presented on with um, uh, others in my team is uh, we used games uh, as uh, team building activities. And uh, everybody in the, in the project has pretty much had to uh, give a presentation that integrated either a game or a game-based uh, sort of activity uh, so that people, grad students and faculty from different disciplines could um, play around at some of the uh, questions and approaches that the different disciplines and um, problems that people have been working on. Um, Chris, uh, so when you're hit. saying game, do you mean like dictator game or like Monopoly? I am talking, we have a variety, we, we have used a variety of games. So um, uh, we have not used a lot of dictator games, although um, since we have economists on the team, we do have a lot of sort of um, economic uh, simulation kind of games. We have used pre-existing games like, um, uh, oh, I'm En-ROADS Climate Simulator. We've, you know, you adapted using the climate, uh, climate simulator um, as a game-based activity. Um, but we also uh, have had people hack uh, you know, party games and board games. Um, so uh, early on, we were trying to come up with a list of uh, environmental uh, uh, equity 
sort of indicators and things that things that as researchers we should look for you know what would be metrics that we could um that we could track or um or try to um you know assess the equity dimensions and uh we basically converted that into um the we converted those sort of um dimensions into a game of uh apples to apples um, which we renamed Zapples to Zapples to give it an electricity theme. Um, and so that was actually a way of a small team that had been working on energy equity metrics to be able to open up the analytic process and sort of making decisions about uh, these metrics and asking questions about what was included and not included in these metrics. It was a way of involving the entire team in a very playful and horizontal way. So in many ways, it was almost like, um, well, for me uh, and for the folks who do participatory action research, it's like that moment where you um, invite community participants to uh, help with the data analysis. You know, it's it's opening. It's basically opening up the analytic process. But we were doing it in this very playful way. And what we've also found is that uh, using games as a sort of platform is a great equalizer between faculty and grad students. And in fact, we we have a way of organizing game teams so that they always involve um, a grad student as the head of the team and then a mix of grad students and faculty from different disciplines. Um, and so that also allowed us to sort of jumpstart some of that convergence uh, informal uh, discussion. And then finally, another thing that we've really enjoyed is there is a very complicated German uh, board game called Power Grid that's about energy auctions, which are not a warm fuzzy topic um, and it can be really hard to get people to uh, engage with if they are not you know industrial operations engineers and or electrical engineers and um, we've had sessions where we play um, power grid and then we um, basically do uh, a critical you know we do um, uh, a critical reimagining of it um, critically hacking the game this is an idea that comes from Oh, I'm uh, Greg Loring Albright, who uh, who came up with a game called First Nations of Catan that is a critical reimagination of Catan. So we've been doing we did that with Power Grid, and that has now become almost like a rite of passage. If we have uh, REU students, research experiences for undergrads um, or new grad students, we always have a Power Grid night and then a debrief where we uh, critically reimagine it. So. I've been going on for a long time, but I want I got talking about games. So <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see if you all write up that approach, I would love to see that. I have a write up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, share it. That's great. Yeah. Okay, Laura or Anais, who would like to go next in describing your projects? I can go. So we the electricity and energy projects are together there. Um so uh, again, like the context of this project is mainly located in the Brazilian Amazon and they are well. Mm, many reasons. One of the big, biggest reasons is that there is still millions of people worldwide who lack access to a reliable, clean, and sustainable electricity source. And what is happening is that governments from the global south, what they are like doing is building large hydroelectric dams in these areas. And particularly, there is a boom of construction of hydro dams in the Brazilian Amazon. In a previous project that we had with uh, NSF also, that it was the Infuse project, that is innovations at the nexus of food, energy, and water systems. We explore the social ecological impacts of hydro dams and energy injustices in three different like big basins of the Amazon. And we found like that the story is not very uh, pleasant and local communities are still lacking access to electricity. The dams are built and they are generating electricity for the industry and people who live in the big cities. So not for the people who are in these areas. So the main goal of the convergence project um, was born because of that. And we noticed that people were off the grid facing the energy injustices generated by these large hydroelectric dams. Like just to give you a context in this area, there's like the fourth largest dam of the world is located there. And people who live next to it, they don't have access to electricity. 
that is Belo Monte in the Shingu River. So we decided to explore and get together with a team of engineers, social scientists, natural scientists, communicators, and I hope that I'm not forgetting anyone else here in the team uh, to um, co-construct and co-develop co with community members an innovative technology solution. And um, what we were doing is, uh, well, first, COVID also uh, affected our performance and going to the field. But luckily, we were able to finish a survey that we were collecting in different bases of the Amazon and then COVID hit. So we were able to start analyzing these data and seeing like communities preferences about electricity. And we had also like data that we collected in the past about energy injustices and social ecological issues. Um, and the, uh, the communicator, communicators started to do a content analysis to see how the media approaches different electricity sources and energy transition. Not surprisingly, they just show the positive aspects and they don't uh, tell the, the sad stories. And with this approach, what we started to do is to communicate with researchers in universities in Brazil, two universities in, in particular, and we started to work together with engineers there that were developing in-strength turbines to generate electricity at a community level. And our project is mainly focused in generate electricity, not just as the service, but also to allow people to improve their livelihoods and their well-being. These communities are using diesel generators, which, well, nowadays they cannot afford because of the high price of fuel that is like worldwide. So they are not, they don't have electricity, and this electricity source is generates pollution, and they just can use it. If they can use it, they just can use it for hours per day. And what we started to do is to communicate with our different stakeholders at the universities, at NGOs, and communicate with them and how can we like get to different communities. And we selected three specific communities that are in the basin of Santarém in Brazil, uh, who are located 15 hours uh, by boat from the urban center. Why we decided to go there? Well, one of the main reasons is because they have been marginalized. They have been ignored by any project about energy access. And these communities are willing to work with us to develop this energy system. And when I talk about develop the energy system is not to develop the technology. The technologies are already developed. They are already set the solar panels or the instrument turbines. But what we could do is that we are designing the energy system. And what I mean about this is that it's a system that will be tailored to their needs, where their electricity needs at the individual level, because we are considering differences between men and women that are within the households. And also within the community, where are their needs? We are designing with them a system that will be polycentric, that they will be able to manage and to uh, uh, accommodate the resources. Um, one of the issues that we have seen in the literature is that when there are these technologies that arrive to the communities and communities they don't know how to manage, these technologies will just like well, damage in the corner and they will not use it. We are um, doing some workshops with local communities, local young researchers and the universities and they are learning how to manage, how to maintain these um, different infrastructures. So the solar panels and the instrument turbines. So communities who are living in the area, they know now how to fix this, these uh, technologies and they can access the materials for fixing it because that was other problem that we noticed that when those technologies are imported, though you can find those in the US, but not in the area of Brazil. So that will be very, unaffordable and well, it will not be feasible. And I think that one of like, this is like very personal. I think that one of the biggest accomplishments that we have had with this, this particular project has been able to conduct with locals some types of research. So we have collected 
um, physical data with them. And what I mean about this is collecting with data like water velocity, uh, different types of that engineers, they know what they have to do and people in the community that have been trained to collect this data. So we will know that the technology will definitely work here. And, and other of the aspects that we have uh, done or other of the accomplishments is that we published a paper in which we are starting to show how is this participatory approach of a convergence with energy systems. And that where this energy system is centered on the needs of the community and not is centered on the needs of the researcher. That is usually as we do research. We have a research question, we want to solve it in a certain way, but sometimes we don't see beyond that. So in this case, our focus are the community needs, what they really want electricity for, and if the technology that we're offering will allow them to get what they want. We have been super transparent also in saying like, you cannot, we, this technology will allow you to do this, but not going that and being transparent with the communities from the beginning has been a, essential in this work. And that energy systems have been adapted to the needs and the tailors of these communities. So far we have conducted uh, different trials and we are still like, uh, moving forward and um, this is not done yet I, what I mean is that the systems are still getting implemented we're still conducting workshops with the communities and um, visioning exercises and well among other aspects uh, I don't know if I have answered all of the questions but maybe yeah you did great. yeah yeah <laughs> good I can start talking and talking about this. I really like it. <laughs> we really like it too. Thank you. So Anais, can you tell us about the Colonias project? Yes. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay, awesome. It's because I have the questions as well outside. So our group, um, like I said earlier, we're approximately uh, a team of 16. We have data scientists, social scientists, particularly anthropologists, um, engineers, social hydrologists and economics and law and policy. And in addition to that, we have three community partners, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, the Rural Community Assistance Corporation and Community Unlimited, which are three community-based uh, nonprofit organizations that cross, um, that work with colonial communities across the four border states, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and Texas. Um, and really, I think that the thesis of our of our project is how do you incorporate both physical infrastructures and social infrastructures to advance water security through an equity lens. And for that, similar to what um, Krista and Laura have, have explained, our team also took a very participatory um, and community engaged and community driven approach. So because our project is so large scale, we are looking at water insecurity across four border states. And the main reason why we focus on the colonial communities is because colonias are unincorporated territories um, of communities that are approximately 150 miles away from the border. They suffer a lot of challenges, particularly with water insecurity, also energy insecurity, food challenges. It's, it's pretty, you know, it's a region that has been um, largely um, disinvestment, disinvested, and that has other um, structural racial and settled colonial um, reasons to that. But our, our main focus with our group was, and also given the pandemic, was to find ways in which ethically we could collaborate with our community partners and with colonial residents in ways that every end user, and by end user, I mean academics, community partners and residents, could find their own um, end goals with the project and also benefits from them. So for example, for academics, it might be that our main focus is publishing in these top tier journals, but for our community partners, their main goal is to get data on the colonist experiences so that they can use that to leverage funding from federal or other nonprofits to be able to provide technical assistance to support water security efforts on the ground. And for the residents, it might look different in terms of thinking that they want more information about their water quality or they want to know more information about um, how to advocate for water 
issues, et cetera, right? Like a lot of clinic or, or other types of approach. So our team um, with all the different expertises involved, what similar to what Amber mentioned at the beginning, we basically didn't know how to speak to each other. And for that, we engaged in several things. So one thing was um, led by um, the engineering team, Dr. Um, Paul Westerhoff and Amber and other members, it's called NADC. So that means um, needs, approach, benefits, and competition. And it's this way that we did this like five minute presentations on the Colonias, uh, of what our team thought the Colonias experience was and how could our discipline support that. And that allowed us bi-weekly to learn the different approaches and techniques and expertise that our team members brought so that we could find ways to start thinking how we could collaborate at a subgroup level or a or at a macro level, including our community partners. So like I mentioned before, even though it's three nonprofit organizations, we have one community representative, Laura Landes, who meets with us weekly or bi-weekly, and it's constantly going back and forth in, some, in the ways of like some of the ideas that the different team members may have, how can that um, be um, accepted or integrated with the community and vice versa, right? Bringing the community's um, perspectives and and, and needs at once into the into the team. Another thing we did, we engaged in a series of speakers um, series. So we invited experts on water, particularly people that work on the border with Colonias um, to bring our their different expertise. So we at one point brought Dr. Tom Romero to talk about law and, and Colonias and as well as other uh, folks also thinking about the different expertises in the group, so engineers, so sort of hydrologists, um, anthropologists, and so forth. We also engage in an internal um, social network analysis because we wanted to see how our team was converging. So if we were collaborating, not only, for example, the engineers with the social scientists, but if this was really happening across the different teams and trying to understand um, mentorship, um, different types of expertise, the different terminologies and methodologies that we all use because of our different expertise, how could those be brought to our team? And one, one big convergence moment, I think, for our team was to develop a, um, a new method that's called community-based participant observation. It's under review, accepted with minor revisions, will be hot in the press sometime soon. Um, and really what we tried to do there was to bring how do we think you specifically about the um, about the pandemic, how can we um, give agency to residents and to our community partners to document their own experiences? And for anthropologists, for those who are not aware, we use this methodology called participant observation, which basically you go into the community, you build rapport and you're you're documenting um, the experiences of community from your perspective. And sometimes that has been shown in the literature that has some ethical um, challenges, particularly thinking that you might be documenting things that people have forgotten in the informed consent process, right? So um, it can be a little dicey. So thinking about community-based research as the, the way that we were already structuring our project, how can we put those together? And how can we bring the different questions and interest from 16 different people three community partners and residents into one document, into one, one like thing that we could then all agree on that we wanted to understand and, and, and find ways to, to support theoretically and apply to our um, big challenge, which is water security in these communities. So that method, right, goes from you know, setting common objectives, deciding what are the research questions, setting expectations, um, co-analysis. So we're now in January engaging in a in a mini co-analysis process. So this is still a very, you know, long ongoing process, but long story short, the idea is to, at least in my views, is to find ways in which you have all these different stakeholders. Everybody has a different um, goal, but we do have a shared objective, which is security, you know, water security. So, shared goal, but there's different ways to do it and combining our different expertises to, to advance that. And some of the, the methods and the approaches that, that we did, I think, were, 
were successful in, in making us think and get into this, what Amber calls aha moments, which is this dynamic of like, oh, like I never thought that I would be like working with um, an engineer thinking about modules of water filters that will be given to the communities in this event and um, training them. And what do we do, for example, what do we do after we show this technology with this great water filter? We, do we just traumatize the community that they are, the water is damp, like it's bad? No, we have to write, like think about what are the next steps of that. So those type of conversations of bridging two disciplines that have been traditionally on silos into one um, conversation with a shared objectives and goals that keep at the same time um, refining and unfolding and, and changing throughout the process, right? Because it's almost like a learning curve, at least in, in our experience. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that kind of like sums a little bit of a, about what we did. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So now we have 10 minutes. So we're going to go into a rapid fire round of four questions with two sentence answers. Okay, and then if we have time, we might be able to take a question or two from the audience. Okay, so the first rapid fire question is what participatory methods um, did you use in this work and you know what would you what, what ones would you say were important for a convergence study. I'll start, which is that every time I'm asked to speak to a convergence group or in one of these interdisciplinary groups, I'm like, uh, if you're using participatory methods, the most important thing is that the community has to be able to say no. Laura. So first thing is that we did a workshop on different activities if they wanted to participate or not in the project. And that was the first thing. The second one uh, was that they, people who wanted to participate in collecting the physical data of the river and the lighting and blah, blah, blah. And the third aspect that we are doing, I hope that I'm not forgetting everything, but it's a workshop of visioning in which all of them get together and start to visualize what they want to do with the electricity that they were want to get in the future. Thank you. Krista, what participatory mechanisms are you using and what ones would you recommend? Yes, so um, we uh, we have been we have been working uh, with uh, we've been working with the community advisory board. That's something that has been a little bit tricky in the you know pandemic period because uh, local community organizations are so strapped and um, and you know there has been staff turnover, so um, so that's a bit of a challenge. But we've got a really strong relationship with our community partner, um, and uh, they first helped us with a series of uh, discussions and focus groups, and then we uh went with a you know which allowed us to really sort of uh figure out how people are wrapping their heads around the energy system on the ground level and then um uh this year we did something really fun which was uh the organization that we're working with has an urban garden and uh they one of their goals was to have a um a solar powered community refrigerator so uh we've been working with students to do iterative design workshops of that and that's a way to um, get people in the community asking questions and interacting with uh engineering students and um uh and folks uh to to talk about renewable energy and how does it work and how could it uh, be used, what would be ways to use it in the community. And that is going to, we hope, lead into um, later this winter, some visioning workshops that are more focused on the system level, um, but but using the uh, design process for the community fridge to um, to get people interested in participating and, okay. and to show our commitment um, to our community partners. Excellent. Anais? Are you still? I am. I just had to turn off my camera for the to hear everybody well. Yes. Um, in general, I think um, each project and Laura's and Krista Harper's talk to this, spoke to this is CBPR, Community Based Participants um, Research. And really overall is, 
you know, there's photo boys, there's so many different participatory methods, but I do want to um, put the cautious note here is that while these are all with well intentions, you should have people in your teams that actually know how to um, enact some of these methods because then you can in many ways do unintended harm to community members. Um, so I definitely think having a community board would be extremely helpful. We don't have that explicitly in our team, but we're constantly weekly or in phone talking with our community partners for every step of the way that we do projects um, and to what extent we co-author with them. Um, and we're aware of what are their, their angles and how can we support that as well as the theoretical goals. So um, yeah, I hope that, that answers the question. Great. Okay, two more questions, two sentence responses only. Convergence is a tricky and difficult research approach, and I've heard some pushback against it. Why are people hating on convergence research? I have one comment, and it's that it's time consuming. If people want to participate in it, they need to realize that it's not a year process. It will take much time, and that's maybe what they are hating about it. Perfect. I agree. I will say that it's also because there's no um, real direct guidelines on how to do it. Um, and that really challenges like a scene in even our conversation. We're all doing participatory and engaged work, but it looks so different across our three places. Absolutely. Krista. Yeah, I think that um, I think that uh, one of the one of the things that people are hating on is um, it's unclear. Uh, uh, exactly what funders, in this case, the NSF, which has really pushed for convergence research, which is much more time consuming. And, you know, you have to take time for developing team collaboration and a common language, and you can't just, you know, hammer stuff out like you would in a traditional project. Um, it's not clear whether they like what they're seeing. <laughs> in terms of uh, the grants that get renewed and things like that. And so I one thing that I really hope does not come out of the uh, convergence, the big convergence grant push is people actually getting turned off on convergence research because you invest a lot of time in getting to know your interdisciplinary colleagues. You start having fun together and then your grant doesn't get um, uh, renewed. So uh, some clearer guidelines on what they're looking for, um, because I think a lot of us have done these social network diagrams, we've done a lot of evaluation of our own convergence activities, and we put a lot of effort into those, and if they don't renew them, then people might just turn back towards traditional disciplinary grants. Yes, and I would add on to that, that the convergence by definition is addressing um, a serious societal need, but all of the metrics and the motivations really align with creating top tier basic science and, you know, the achievements that come along with that. But as we're all describing, you know, to actually address a societal need requires a huge time investment in building relationships with people who are affected by that social problem. Um, so that seems to be an unresolved tension in the convergence approach. Okay, well, last question, two sentence responses. Um, if someone were to have a newly funded convergence study, what advice would you give them? So I will say that uh, break all of the epistemology barriers and be ready to create knowledge in different ways. Be ready to include other members and people who have no traditional like education to collaborate with you and um, see other measurements besides one and zeros in your analysis. That's my <laughs> advice. Thank you. I would, I would say um, have a uh, method ready uh, for quickly getting different team members um, on a, you know, on sort of a a basic footing, a sort of your discipline 101 footing with each other. It looks like my team did it largely through games um, and, you know, presentations and games. Um, and it sounds like uh, Anais and Amber's team used this NACB presentation series, which sounds really fascinating. And we would love to hear more about that over at Elevate, um, maybe sometime how you did that. Um, so yeah, a, a quick way for people to get up to speed on each other's 
disciplines and how they would approach the problem. Thank you. We have a paper on that with Westerhoff et al. 2021. Anais, advice? I would say it's it's a hard one, but I will just say um, that everybody in the onboarding team should read about teen science. We didn't for the, for the delved in today's conversation, but they have done some really good job in thinking about some of the challenges um, and opportunities when you bring different um, disciplines together. So that I think it's an important base for doing convergence research. And I would recommend there's a book by Barry Bozeman called Strength in Numbers that summarizes the science of teen science work. That's a great place to start. Um, and the advice I would give as a PI of one of these is you cannot overestimate the administrative burden. And so, you know, that administrative burden will not be covered sufficiently by one grant. It's like you need administrative staff, you need financial staff, you know, because basically the convergence has three parts, basic research, community outreach, and self-study of the convergence process, right? So it's three studies in one, and the amount of administrative burden is unspeakable. Um, so make sure that you have other mechanisms to supplement uh, the financial support for your administrative staff. All right, well, we are at our time. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, and this will be posted on YouTube so others applying for convergence funds can study up on our experiences. Thank you for sharing them. And thank you everyone for coming.